This meeting will come to order. This is a special meeting of the planning board. Quiet, please. Thank you. This is a public workshop presentation of and public comment on the draft zoning use restrictions and design regulations for the proposed Atlantic Beach Overlay Zoning District. Uh, the way this uh, meeting will go is we'll have a presentation from planning department staff. Uh, planning board members will uh, ask questions, make comments, and then we will open it up to the public. At that time, everyone will have um, a five minute segment to make their comments, and then depending on available time, we can allow more time for public comments. So with that, uh, turn it over to Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so if you could just go to the next slide, Rita. The agenda for tonight, um, we're gonna talk about the background, how we got to where we are tonight. I'll review the draft design considerations that were prepared by um, one of the subcommittees of the planning board We'll talk about the draft use limitations prepared by another subcommittee of the planning board. Uh, then we'll open it up for the planning board to, to make comments and questions and, and then we'll have uh, public comments and questions um, on the proposed drafts. Um, I would just want to emphasize that th these are very early rough drafts of these proposed regulations. The goal of this meeting and, and what the planning board is really looking for is input from the public. Um, get an idea of whether we're moving in the right direction or not. If things um, aren't being covered in the drafts that you feel should be covered, the board uh, would like to know about that. Uh, and then obviously if there are things in the drafts that you don't like, we'd like to hear about that too. Um, so with that, go on to the next slide please. Start, start by talking about the next step so we understand where we're going. So as I said, this is, early drafts of the proposed regulations. We're receiving public input tonight, and we'll also be receiving any written comments um, for a couple of weeks through the uh, uh, Friday, August 16th. And then following that, following all the public comment uh, comments being received, we'll be working with the planning board to produce a revised draft um, for further consideration. I've suggested to the board that another, at that point, another public meeting would be appropriate to present the revised draft. It'll be a similar format, um, presenting the revisions, uh, allowing for, for planning board uh, input and public input. Following that meeting, there may be additional revisions to the drafts and all that will happen um, before we send anything on to the town council. Um, so the formal process for adopting any zoning regulations or amendments is to have the planning board complete its drafting and review and public meetings. They will then forward a recommendation to the town council. The town council then holds a formal public hearing per state statute. So there's that additional opportunity for public input at the town council level. So uh, my point being that there's plenty of opportunity for input. Um, we're fairly early on at this point. Uh, so. I uh, just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. So getting into background, this current process where we are right now started um, over the past several months. It was really instigated uh, through discussions with the Town Council Planning Board and the Middletown Economic Development Advisory Committee at a point where um, the Town Council was uh, considering uh, proposal or, or suggestion that there be a moratorium placed on development within the Atlantic Beach District. As those uh, conversations took place, um, it was de determined by the Town Council that a better course of action um, would be to have the Planning Board, and the, it, there was a joint meeting in February where the three committees sat together, uh, with the outcome being that the Planning Board would go through this process that, that they are currently in to produce an overlay district to address um, some of the concerns that were being raised and particularly to um, look at the uh, 2007 Atlantic Beach District Master Plan document 
um, which I know many of you are familiar with, um, which it happens to also be referenced in the Middletown Comprehensive Community Plan, uh, there is an action item which I'll show you, um, which talks about uh, implementing that 2007 uh, master plan. So the thought was that, well, that would be an appropriate um, exercise to make this effort to implement the recommendations of that Atlantic Beach District Master Plan. So that, that's really the starting place and, and where, we're, where we took off um, from in this discussion. As I mentioned, there were two uh, planning board subcommittees established, one focusing on de design elements and one focusing on, on the use table. Uh, approximately 10 subcommittee meetings between the two subcommittees took place over the past uh, several months and which resulted in the draft documents that are available on the website. And, and I'll just mention too that uh, as you came in, the notice for the meeting um, has the, the address, the web address for where you can find these draft documents that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, they're fairly lengthy, lengthy, so I didn't make copies for everybody, but they're available online. And um, again, after tonight, for the next couple of weeks, if you have an opportunity to, to review those documents and you have any comments you wish the planning board to get, uh, you can send those along to me. And at the end of the presentation, my web, uh, my um, email address will be on the screen. Or you can always mail them to, to, to the town hall. So talking about the Atlantic Beach District Master Plan, I'm just, I'll try to go through this quickly. Like I said, I know, I know several of you are familiar with, with this document. Um, this, is, this was a document produced back in 2007 with consultant assistance on, on behalf of the planning board. It was presented to the town and the town council. And as I, as I mentioned, it was adopted by reference um, in the town's uh, current uh, comprehensive community plan. The purpose of that document, as, as noted in the document, was to serve as the primary document guiding the transformation of this area into a vibrant, walkable commercial area, capitalizing on its relatively dense development pattern and proximity to local beaches, historic Newport, and other attractions. And then the vision um, that, the, that the planning board discussed was that it become a more pedestrian-oriented, attractive, vibrant commercial village to serve the influx of seasonal visitors, the surrounding residential neighborhoods in the town. And then there were four goals identified for the document, um, promoting pedestrian activity and providing streetscape improvements in the area, studying traffic flow and parking, identifying opportunities to capitalize on the proximity of the district uh, to the beaches, and uh, the last item, which is really the focus of this current effort, was to identify options to promote private development that will be consistent with the vision for the district, including opportunities to promote an appropriate mix of uses and building and site design. So that last uh, goal is really what we're focusing on with this current effort. I'm not gonna read through all these statements. These, these, these are just some, some of the uh, statements coming out of the plan uh, related to uh, the district and some of the recommendations. Uh, the Atlantic Beach District serves as a seasonal, uh, serves the seasonal visitors in the residential neighborhoods, providing an atmosphere, atmosphere for tourists. Residents frequent local businesses as well. Um, then there was this, this last statement that during the public workshops, there was a sense that the area um, has a basis to be a thriving community, um, but it's, it's equally important that, um, that it be a walkable community, that there be opportunities for the residents to, to access the neighborhood and get some use out of the neighborhood. Some more statements relative relatively high concentration of restaurants and hotel uses is indicative of the tourist-driven economy. Um, there are suggestions that uh, in order to serve the needs of the local residents, the town should encourage additional retail uses within the district. Uh, these, the, the, another statement, these uses could easily be, easily be adapted to serve both local residents and tourists. And then the last, last uh, statement there, the zoning within the district is generally appropriate for the types of uses that exist. And then further down it says, uh, you know, there are some uses allowed by special use permit that are probably not appropriate within the district. And 
And then again, the, um, the goals and uh, action items for, from the comprehensive plan relative to this were contained within the economic development element of the comprehensive plan, and I've, I've got the references there. Uh, the Atlantic Beach District Master Plan serves as a primary document, so that again, that's a statement directly out of the master plan. One of the action items is to promote the development and enhancement of mixed-use business districts in appropriate locations, and it references the Atlantic Beach District as well as our proposed West Main Coddington redevelopment area. Uh, another policy, support economic growth and job creation in the local tourism and hospitality industry. And then an action item related to that is to facilitate implementation of the recommendations of the Atlantic Beach District Master Plan. So that's really, again, the basis for um, where the planning board uh, started its work. So I had maps out on the table, so hopefully you picked one up. This, this is the depiction of the proposed boundaries for the overlay district. Um, it's essentially, if not exactly, the same boundary as the current limited business zoning district. As an overlay district, um, it overlays the underlying zoning, which in this case is limited business. And at, the overlay district then has modifications to some of the regulations, whether it's use or design, and other regulations um, that the underlying district uh, addresses. So where there might be a conflict between what the limited business district allows versus what the overlay district allows once it's adopted, it would be the overlay district, district that would govern. Um, there are some specific design requirements in the regulations that, um, and I, I guess I should back up. So what this will end up resulting in, this, this whole effort, will be proposed amendments, modifications to, to two documents. The town zoning ordinance, which is where a lot of the use requirements and restrictions are contained, as well as some of the dimensional, uh, lot dimensional requirements. There's a separate document, which is, the, really the planning board's document, it's the uh, rules and regulations regarding the development of land, subdivision and development of land in town. And that's, that's the planning board's document which they use when they're reviewing any subdivisions or other uh, commercial and other types of development. So those two documents um, will, if, this, if anything is adopted, will end up being amended um, in one way or another. So. Again, there's, there's specific regulations in the, in the regulations now that might be modified as a result of this overlay district being adopted. Um, and then in the zoning ordinance, uh, the, the use subcommittee has uh, created a table, which again, it's posted online. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. Uh, if not after the meeting, I'd, I'd encourage you to go through that table. It's the town zoning use table where a new column has been added. Um, the Atlantic Beach District column, and it will, uh, when and if it's adopted with whatever uh, modifications are, are adopted by the town council, it'll be a separate column in the use table that will define which uses uh, can uh, be, be, uh, be developed within the district. Um, there's three categories. It's either permitted by right, permitted by special use permit, or um, prohibited. So. That's the rundown of what the overlay district um, is about. I don't know, if Peter, if you had anything you wanted to add to that description. No, I agree with that. Essentially, we've got a, a more limited set of uses and a more specific and uh, restricted set of design standards that will apply to the buildings in this district. Um, and as you said, if there's any conflict between the overlay regulations and what would otherwise be allowed in the limited business zone and the overlay regulations, All right, so the next, the next part of the presentation is, is going to be, hopefully, quickly. I try not to take too much time. I know we want to get some input from, from you all, but um, I'm going to try to run quickly through the recommendations coming out of the subcommittees. Um, not, not everything in the proposed drafts is here. I, I had to kind of curtail 
um, what ended up on the slides, um, but I think I, I took most of the major points out of those drafts. Um, so the first being uh, from the design subcommittee talking about building design. Um, first item, and I know that this is an item of, of concern and discussion and, and really um, relates to where this conversation started several months ago was regarding hotels within the district and a, and a desire on the part of some folks to limit um, hotel development in some way. So as a, as a starting point, and again, this is a draft open for discussion, would be to um, not, not prohibit hotels, but to require um, any hotel uh, that is developed to have at least 75% of its first floor um, dedicated to some other use, whether it's retail or office. Um, so one of the issues, one of the concerns that we've heard already is that um, a lot of the hotel development it would be restricting the ability for other types of, of development, retail or other types of uses to develop in the area and that uh, the concern was you'll end up with a district that's completely hotels. So by requiring that, that within hotel buildings there will be space on the first floor is dedicated to other uh, types of uses, um, the, that's, that's the attempt to try to address that concern. Um, also a discussion of potentially limiting the maximum building footprint of new buildings. So this would be uh, the amount of land uh, that is taken up by the building, regardless of how tall it is and the total square footage of the building, the footprint of the building, um, talking about a limitation on that, and again, uh, up for discussion, uh, 5,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet um, as, a, as a starting point for discussion. Um, limiting buildings to 35 feet in height, which is already a regulation, but certainly wanting to maintain that. Um, requiring or, or I guess prohibiting uh, flat roofed buildings under the current design requirements it encourages um, uh, pitched roof buildings but it allows for flat roof buildings if, if approved by the planning board so the subcommittee is, is basically taking uh, a step further and prohibiting flat roof buildings outright um, requiring or I guess depending on how you look at it, allowing or, or requiring additional uh, glazing windows on the first floor over what's currently in the regulations. Currently there's a range of 20 to 60 percent of glazing as a minimum, or I guess as a range, 20 to 60 percent. Um, for first floors, the recommendation was to increase that to 50 to 75 percent. Again, trying to understand that if you're going to have retail development on the first floor, you want to have large windows. Um, for display. Um, taking away, again, under the current regulations, there is a limitation on the types of windows that can be used, um, or at least a suggestion. Double hung windows are the preferred option under the current town commercial design standards. Uh, the proposal is to take away that uh, requirement and allow more flexibility mm -hmm. in the types of windows that can be used, whether they're casement windows, or sliding windows, or whatnot. Um, but still requiring uh, that there be either true divided light or simulated divided light windows uh, regardless of the construction of the window. Um, requiring that entrance doors to the, to the front facade um, go directly from the sidewalk into the building. Um, you'll see later on there's also a, a restriction uh, that there'll be no front yard parking allowed under the current regulations. Front yard parking is allowed, but side yard and rear yard parking is preferred. Um, under this proposal, the drafts, um, that front yard parking would not be permitted. It would, it would um, really, the goal again being to get the buildings close to the street to promote uh, pedestrian activity. And then this, this is an ongoing um, concern and it's an existing requirement that rooftop mechanical equipment be screened. And jumping into landscaping requirements um, and site design requirements. So in order to, I guess, backing up, one of the concerns of the subcommittee, the design subcommittee, was wanting to preserve and promote, um, as properties get redeveloped, an open, an open feeling within the district, m maintaining um, views. That was one of the, the big things that we've heard is wanting to maintain views um, to the pond, to the ocean, as much as possible, not having essentially, um, uh, I, I 
you know, someone mentioned it being a, a canyon being developed down on Aquidneck Avenue. We don't want a canyon of buildings. Um, we want to re, re, uh, maintain some openness in the development pattern. So one of the suggestions is that you require that buildings um, have, it, have their um, sh longest side perpendicular to the street, essentially um, making sure that there's um, room on the side of the buildings within the lot, which is perhaps where the parking might be or landscaping, not having a wall uh, basically taking up the entire frontage of the property. Um, as I mentioned, front yard parking would be prohibited, um, requiring bicycle racks um, as part of any new development, uh, maintaining existing trees on the property when practical. Um, this is something that's, that's um, already addressed in the current design requirements. Um, one thing that these next, these next three bullets address is, is the idea of buffering and screening. Um, screening would be a solid fence or a solid uh, vegetated <coughs> wall, um, like an arborvitae or some type of hedge um, that would basically screen the view of the property from abutting properties or from the street. A buffer is not necessarily the same as screening. A buffer is, a, is a, an area that's landscaped in some way. It could be grass, it could be low shrubs. Um, so I just want to make sure that you understand the, the, the difference between the screening requirement and the buffer requirement. Buffering is a, some width of landscaped area where the and then within the buffer there might be screening, which would be a taller, um, whether it's vegetation or a fence, to screen the property. Um, under current regulations, there's uh, pretty stringent requirements for screening and buffering on all commercial properties. These proposed regulations would actually reduce um, the amount of screening and buffering, again, with the goal being to maintain that open feel um, within, within that part or within that neighborhood. Uh, so it would reduce, uh, well, it would actually um, discourage the use of screening between commercial properties and limit any, any vegetation or fencing to four feet high and then reduce the, the buffering width between properties from 10 feet uh, to five feet. Proper, for properties, commercial properties abutting residential, um, where right now there is a 20 foot wide buffer required, that gets reduced to 10. The screening requirement would however remain. So even though the buffering may be reduced, you would still, it, where a commercial property abuts a residential property, still be required to screen screen the property, the commercial property, from that residential abutter. Uh, next slide, I guess. Third bullet down, um, fencing. One, one thing that, that came up during the discussion with the subcommittee is Concern again, again, not wanting to uh, block views was the type of fencing that might be uh, promoted um, and allowed. The idea of requiring any fencing to be a, some sort of open fencing is is being proposed, whether it's a um, wrought iron fence or or even a, a nicely done chain link fence. I think a, a black chain link fence was was cited as a potential attractive option. Um, or even an open uh, so, sort of wood fence, whether it's a split rail fence. Um, again, the idea is to try to maintain the views as much as possible. One, one example that I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with is the Cumberland Farms development. Um, that, that property uh, initially proposed, a, I think it was a six or eight foot um, white PVC solid fence along the back property line, uh, essentially cutting off the property from the views of the pond. And as you know, um, when you when you go by that property or if you visit the property, there's a it's an open metal fence uh, which allows that view of the pond to be retained. So that's that's the idea with that with that suggestion. Um, planting of street trees that was discussed quite a bit again with a concern about um, over over vegetating the district. Um, currently the requirement for any commercial development is to require uh, planting of street trees, trees along the, the front, uh, the frontage of the property 
at 30 foot intervals, deciduous uh, street trees, so that's, a, that's the requirement. Uh, the planning board is recommending, suggesting that that be addressed on a case by case basis as they're reviewing site development plans. There may be um, situations where street trees are appropriate and others where, where they may not be appropriate again if, if the goal is to preserve uh, the view. Um, deciduous uh, trees within parking lots, again, um, there is a current requirement in commercial design regulations of, to have one deciduous parking lot tree per five parking spaces. Uh, the proposal is to reduce that requirement to one tree per 10 parking spaces. And then as is currently the case in the regulations to uh, require the use of dark sky compliant exterior lighting. Ron, it's probably worth noting that uh, some of those suggestions came from the members of the Tree Commission. That's true, right, yep. So the next, next section, which I'm, I'm really gonna hopefully go quickly through is signs. Um, this, this section does need some additional work. <coughs> um, there's opportunities to improve upon the town's current sign regulations. Uh, we investigated some examples from other communities, uh, communities on the Cape, Nantucket, and elsewhere, and cobbled together some ideas for the planning board to, to consider. Um, I'll just run through some of the ideas requiring that signs, well, I guess first and foremost, which actually didn't make it onto the slide, unfortunately, is that there would be no interior illuminated signs um, allowed. That's the proposal, no, interi no interior illumination. Any, any signs would have gooseneck lighting or some other exterior illumination if, the, if they need to be illuminated at all. Um, signs of, of uh, using wood or, or some material that mimics wood are, would be preferred in a carved style. Um, I've already heard a, a suggestion that, you know, another term would be to, to require raised lettering, or maybe it's a combination of both, raised lettering, lettering the end or carved. Um, that, that's what's on the table for discussion. Um, regarding the dimensional criteria, um, there, are, there are different types of signs uh, allowed in town now. Uh, pole signs, which is a sign basically on a single pole, it's usually a taller sign. Um, post, what we call post signs, which are signs that are um, basically two, po two poles with a sign um, spanning the front. It's usually a lower sign. And then monument signs would be the lowest sign. That's, that would be sort of like a, a stone or a concrete sign that's basically on the ground. Um, maximum of four feet tall is, is what's being proposed. So there's those three types of signs. Under the proposed regulations, pole signs, which would be those tallest types of signs, would not be permitted within the district. Um, post signs would, would be allowed, um, but at a lower height and, and, and a smaller area, square footage, than what is currently allowed in the regulations. Currently, uh, you can do up to a six foot tall, um, 16 square foot uh, post sign. The proposal, as you see, is five feet tall, 12 square feet. Uh, monument signs, as I mentioned, four feet tall. That wouldn't that wouldn't change. But the um, the current allow allowable area of 24 square feet would, would be reduced to 12 square feet. Um, there's some reduction in the uh, size, maximum size of wall signs that would be allowed. Currently, the max allowed is 32 square feet. Um, on a building, the proposal is to reduce that to 20 square feet as a maximum. Um, wall signs would still, as proposed, be tied to the width of the storefront or the building. So under the current regulations, the, the wall sign is allowed to be one square foot per foot of, of storefront. So the, the width of the storefront or the width of the building. Um, you get one square foot of signage for each foot of that width. Up to that, up to the maximum, which again in this case is proposed to be 20 feet. Um, projecting signs, which I don't believe are currently addressed in the in the sign regulations, um, but these are signs that basically come out perpendicular from the from the wall, uh, the facade of the building. Um, those would be allowed and allowed up to nine square feet. And then discussion of window signs and awning signs, which are currently allowed in town. Um, these regulations would be somewhat less than what's what's currently allowed. 
So again, I think when we're talking about signs, I think the, the, the point for tonight's conversation and, and for the next couple of weeks as we're seeking additional input would be generally what, what does the town want to see? Do we want to see, is it appropriate to, to talk about smaller signs in that part of town? Um, the next couple of slides, which I'm actually not going to go through in any detail, offer a couple of different options. Um, one option um, would be not allowing freestanding signs at all and allow, allowing only signs on the buildings, wall signs, projecting signs, window signs, and that sort of thing. Um, and then the second option would, would allow for uh, the continued use of, of freestanding signs along with the other types of signs. So again, that's a question that I think is still hanging out there and, and we'd love to hear some input tonight from you all as to, as to your thoughts on whether it's freestanding signs should be allowed or not. There, there curr currently are, and I don't know about every property, but many of the properties do currently have freestanding signs. Um, is that appropriate or not? And then on to the use table subcommittee recommendations. So again, here I didn't certainly didn't uh, reproduce the whole use table, just pulled out uh, some examples of the uses that are al allowed in each category. Um, so uh, uses that would be allowed by, by right are listed here, general retail, convenience stores, restaurants, um, without alcohol would be allowed by right, general professional offices, banks without drive, drive up windows, uh, line, land, laundromat, dry cleaner, drop-offs, um, barber shop, beauty salon, massage, physical therapy, <coughs> exercise center, um, which would be more of like a, a, a small gym, uh, miscellaneous repair shops. So these are all uses that are proposed in the current draft to be allowed by right, and, and many of those are currently allowed by right under the current limited business zoning district regulations. Uses allowed by special use permit are proposed that any, any larger um, retail establishment, so 20,000 square feet or larger, would require a special use permit. Banks with drive up windows or drive up ATMs, uh, convenience store with gasoline sales, restaurants with alcohol, uh, movie theaters, arcades, pool, uh, pool parlor, mini golf. Uh, Mixed-use buildings with residential um, associated with it, hotel, motel, which again, a lot of these are currently already required to get special use permits, so some of, some of this isn't, isn't a change at all from what the current requirements are. Um, a new use that was discussed by the use subcommittee, a brewery or distillery. Um, there, there is one that's being developed, if not already open, in, in, the, uh, in the neighborhood. The discussion with that, this would be a new use, a new, a new use added to the use table that's not currently there. Um, that if that use is going to be allowed within the district, um, again, not, not that it's going to apply town-wide, but just for the Atlantic Beach District, that that use must also include retail sales and or a tasting room open to the public, the idea being that you don't want that manufacturing type of brewery or distillery there. You want it to be more of a public um, use oriented business where folks are able to walk down the street and walk in and um, buy, um, buy or taste samples. Um, wireless communications facilities, special use power, which is currently the case, and vehicle uh, rentals. So the, ju again, just some examples, this is by no means the entire use table. So th in the next category, use is prohibited. This is where there's, there's more changes um, compared to what the current use table in the limited business district would allow. Almost all of the industrial manufacturing uses, and there's a whole category, it's actually two separate categories within the use table, industrial manufacturing, almo almost all of those uses um, would be prohibited within the Atlantic Beach District. Um, auto repair, car washes would be prohibited. Those are currently allowed in limited business by special use permit. Wholesale distribution would be prohibited within the district. Those are currently allowed by special use permit in limited business. Um, retail, uh, lumber building materials, large scale shopping centers, tavern cocktail lounge, would would be prohibited, it's currently allowed by special use permit. Um, most of the transportation and utilities uses, um, 
for example, self-storage, which happens to be under one of those categories, I'm not sure why, but self-storage facilities are currently allowed by special use permit in the limited business district. Uh, those would be, pro would be prohibited in the Atlantic Beach District. Most of the agricultural uses, I guess for obvious reasons, would not be allowed within the Atlantic Beach District. Field crops, livestock, not something you're going to see down there anyway. Um, single family and duplex residential, which is allowed by special use permit in the limited business district, would not be permitted within uh, the Atlantic Beach District. Um, and again, we're talking just to that limited area that was outlined on the map. Those are almost, uh, well, like I said, it's, it's, it's a limited business zoning district. Um, they're primarily commercial uses. There are some single family. Any existing single family uses or duplex uses, they don't immediately have to go away. They would be considered non-conforming uses if, if that change were to be adopted. And then, as I mentioned um, earlier, the idea of uh, allowing for mixed use development, commercial with some um, residential associated with it would be permitted um, in the uh, in the district. So multifamily is prohibited. If it was a single standalone multifamily building, that would not be allowed. If it was a mixed use building with first floor commercial, second, third floor residential, that would be something that would be allowed. So with that, I think I'm done with the highlights. Um, again, just. To reiterate the next steps, we'll be receiving public comment through the 16th. Planning board will uh, determine, probably not tonight, but at some point, um, as we as we understand what kind of input we're getting, decide when we will meet again to uh, produce the revised draft and, and also schedule the next public meeting. And we'll proceed, uh, as I discussed earlier, from there. Um, and then the, the final slide has my contact information. So any comments uh, that you want to get to the planning board, you can get those, uh, get to the board through me, um, either by mail or by email. And uh, we'll be happy to, I'll be happy to pass those along to the planning board and, and add that to the, to the mix as they consider how to proceed. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I am done with my presentation. Thank you, Ron. Uh, comments from the board? Yeah, I'll go. <clears throat> All right, and then BJ. Yeah, this plan was approved a long time ago by the council, way back in 2007. It sat on the shelf for a long time. It was brought to life by the Meat Act Committee, uh, particularly John Bagwell and Bob Silva. And we've always thought it's a great opportunity. Uh, if you've noticed, driving from south to north on East Main Road, what a more pleasant drive that is now with the billboards down and the cabin's gone and everything else. And one of the ideas from our planning board was we need to dress up the southern entrance. So when people come from Newport, they're gonna say, wow, this, this looks like a great place. So I was on the uh, committee with uh, Bill Nash and John Shomo uh, on the use tables. And just to give you an idea of the things we went through and the experience we had, Bill Nash was our chairman. Bill spent a lot of time here in Middletown on the zoning and the zoning department. He serves in the same capacity in Warren now. I've done this work here for about 20 years, and John's about six or seven years. So we, we took our time. We uh, looked at common sense, things that would seem to fit there. And occasionally, we had a lawyer come by uh, to help us along with, uh, with things. So we, we think we've done a pretty good job, but I'd be anxious to see what, uh, what everybody thinks. So it's a unique project. We're using unique financing to make it work, the TIP program. and. We're kind of excited about it. I hope you are too. BJ? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yes, I just want to give kudos to uh, the Tree Commission uh, that did spend quite a bit of time. Paul and I met with them a number of times. Uh, Chuck DiTucci, Bob Johnson, Alan Kirby, uh, and Bill DeMarco, and also Paul, as I said, and myself. And uh, we discussed uh, lots of things for that area. And some of the suggestions were extremely good, well thought out, uh, pr particularly protecting the scenic views uh, while encompassing the trees, saving the trees, or introducing trees that would enhance the area. 
but not overdoing it. Uh, providing a pleasant area for pedestrians to walk. This is what the Tree Commission came up with, as well as specifying public and private landscaping. Um, the the, the uh, Tree Commission and uh, our little subcommittee here did spend quite a bit of time, and I want to thank them all, and I, I hope that uh, you'll look at some of their suggestions and make some comments, please. Mike. Um, is there any uh, discussion at all about the, uh, the proposed, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, moving the utilities underground? I know that's, that was one discussion that was going on with this. That's not part of this discussion. No. That's not part of this discussion. No. Okay, well, it won't impact anything that's discussed here as far as no, science. This is, this is zoning, so it has nothing, not that it has nothing to do with it, but the, the purpose of the zoning is to talk about what's happening on the private side of the property line. Mm -hmm. There are those projects, um, the streetscapes project, which is related to the undergrounding of the utilities that's proceeding or, you know, that's regardless of whether the zoning changes or not, that project will proceed one way or the other. We're still waiting, I guess, you know, for those in the room that are interested, we're still waiting for um, the feasibility study and cost estimates from National Grid on the undergrounding project, the undergrounding of the utilities. Um, that was promised uh, in the spring, and we're now hearing that it'll be mid-August that we'll get that feasibility study back with the cost estimates. And that will allow the town to determine um, when uh, or how it's going to proceed, if it's going to proceed with the undergrounding of the utilities. Uh, that decision needs to be made before we proceed with the final design of the streetscapes project as the, um, whether the utilities end up underground or not will de determine the design of the streetscapes, the sidewalk improvements, and all of those and other ideas that were talked about. So that's all in, still in the works. It's coming, um, delayed a little bit, but um, again, it's separate from the zoning discussion. Any other comments? Joe? Hi, I'm uh, the newest guy here on the planning board, and unfortunately, I missed a lot of the work that was done by my uh, constituents here prior to my joining, I think it was in April. But um, I just wanna say, I'm very excited to hear what the public has to say. Um, I think we have a tremendous opportunity in front of us. I've lived on Easton's <coughs> Point for a little over 20 years. I can count on one hand the number of times I've walked or ridden my bike down to this area, and I'm down there at least once a day. So. Um, I, I have a few comments. Um, my comments are in the use table. If I could raise some questions or just make comments at this point. Um, on page eight under wireless communication facilities, <coughs> um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an item for disguised facility, but there are also two others called building mounted facilities and communication tower. And I'm wondering if we should maybe add the condition that they be disguised in the Atlantic Beach District something to consider. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just on that, there's a distinction between types of wireless facilities. There are small cell wireless facilities, basically 5G facilities that under the new state law are a permitted use in every zoning district. So those would not be able to be prohibited. Um, well, I'm, I'm not yeah. saying we should prohibit anything. Yep. Disguise them. But we might may, may make a distinction between the types, okay. that's all I mentioned. Just a comment. Um, on the next page where the um, 20,000 square feet of retail space was introduced, is that uh, total space as opposed to footprint, Ron? Correct, that's floor area. Okay. Yep. And uh, my only other comment is on the very last page there is uh, an item for traditional farm-related accessory uses other than product stands, and a Y was assigned, but I'm wondering if an S might not be more appropriate. Just a comment. Any other comments from members of the board? 
Okay, we'll take comments from the public. Um, if you wish to speak, please come up to the podium, state your name and address. You'll have five minutes, and uh, depending on how it goes, we may allow more time later. Your five minutes starts when the green light comes on. When the yellow light comes on, that means you have two minutes remaining, and the red light means your time is up. Would anyone like to speak? Offer some comments. John. John Bagwell, 587 Tuckerman Avenue, of course, Middletown. First of all, I want to uh, compliment <coughs> the subcommittee and the planning board for this document. It really gets in down, in, as I say, into the weeds, which it should, and uh, reflects a lot of hard work and thoughtful uh, uh, discussion, obviously, because, um, and I, I, I know your goal is to have the development in that area reflect the, uh, the guidance that's provided in the Atlantic Beach system district master plan and the comprehensive plan. Now, uh, in, after, uh, in January uh, 24th, Ron sent a memo. I better put my, I see my timing. <laughs> sent a memo basically describing uh, the uh, points that were in the master plan and the comprehensive plan. In response to that, I sent a memo <coughs> to, uh, to Ron and to the chairman at that time of the uh, subcommittee. And I made three suggestions. I'd like to review those and tell you what my rea how this responds. I have a couple of comments. First of all, uh, under building design, I, su I suggested you remove the flat roof option. You have, and that's terrific. Secondly, uh, my second comment under that was to promote architecture with, quote, traditional New England elements. That comes right out of the building code. And uh, uh, as the draft says, promote design consistent with traditional architectural styles of a Quidnick Island and traditional New England seaside villages. My comment is I suggest you remove reference to a Quidnick Island. Uh, this would include many architectural styles not consistent with New England seaside villages. And I think if you leave that in, people will say, wait a minute, you know, give me an option. This is, it looks, I want, this looks like something on a West Main Road. Well, I think. If the focus is New England style villages, say that and remove any reference to a Quidditch Island. Height, second area was my suggestion on height. Uh, I said, my suggestion was you assure buildings that buildings do not exceed 35 feet in height, even for flood zone adjustments. Now the principal, the, the draft says principal buildings shall be limited to 35 feet in height. Now if you mean that, uh, under state law, they'd say, well, that's 35 plus flood adjustments up maybe 10 or 15 feet. So they got a 50 foot building. If you really mean it should be 35 feet, say, even with the flood zone adjustments. So if it's 35 feet, that means uh, that the, uh, uh, you've only got yourself maybe with flood zone adjustments, 20 feet of space. Well, so be it. If your goal is to limit the height of buildings to 35 feet, <coughs> say it. And the third point is the fencing. Uh, this, my suggestion was they should be designed to maintain the views. That's what the Atlantic Beach System Master Plan says. And the open fencing, and I feel, feel it's Cumberland Farms, I cite, should be cited as an example. And nothing wrong with citing something in town as an example of what you mean. Uh, now the draft says open design, dark color, fine. Included black chain link as acceptable. I'm trying to visualize how a black chain link fence would be acceptable. So I suggest you remove that. And uh, finally, uh, you, you note front yard, four feet, elsewhere five feet. Uh, five feet it could be a little high if it's on the side toward a pond. So I know that there's a lot of work done on the Cumberland Farms thing, and the result I think is fantastic. So I don't know how you get there, but uh, that's a process for you folks. So uh, my suggestion is you remove any reference to black chain Lake fences. Uh, that basically uh, are my comments. But the last one, one last thought occurred to me as I was sitting there. You have a lot of detail as far as signage, and you want it to look like a new, typical New England seaside village. Uh, if I, if one of you could say yes, or, or Ron could say, we've had the signage reviewed by an architect who's familiar 
with New England seaside villages, I'd say fine. But if you haven't, I would suggest that you do. And that ends it with 40 seconds to spare. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please. Valerie Gelb, 94 Shore Drive. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity for voting taxpayers to actually have input into this overlay district, which we've wanted for a long time. I know you've spent a lot of time and energy on the subcommittees developing this proposal, and we appreciate it. The overall goal of your input and ours is to always ensure that the vision of the Atlantic Beach District Master Plan is realized. A few things to keep in mind for further subcommittee meetings and more real-time feedback um, that I've gotten from many of our neighbors is to have meetings held at more reasonable hours for people to be able to attend who work. Meetings at 2.30, 3 o'clock didn't seem to quite fit into their schedules, even though they're observatory only, observation only. The sheer volume of information, as Ron mentioned, for any layperson is a lot to absorb, but I hope people take the time to try to absorb it. And I'm personally grateful to Ron for graciously answering my 18 questions before tonight. Um, and I know we have many more, Ron. <laughs> um, after this evening's session, I'll be sure to send uh, the planning board suggestions for consideration in writing as we won't have time for everything. Um, it should be noted, and Ron said this, but I want to be sure our neighbors remember that the Atlantic Beach District Master Plan has been adopted as part of the Middletown Comprehensive Plan, so it is an important document to us as neighbors. Um, it will be important, though, to understand some of the overarching premises in order to um, proceed with the uses table as well as the design elements. The uses table subcommittee recommended that single-family, two-family, multi-family new buildings be prohibited. Now, of course, that's future if they become available. Whereas today, it's a special use under limited business. Per the limited business definition, which is very important in this area, is the district is established to provide areas for day-to-day -day localized shopping needs, convenience shopping, services to neighborhood areas to provide limited specialized business uses. So based on this definition and this sensitive urban area in the Atlantic Beach District Master Plan, there actually seems to be an incongruence in eliminating any residences in this area, and yet the subcommittee, through special permit, would allow housing in the following areas. Senior housing living facilities, rooming houses, family daycare, motels, hotels, timeshares, community residences, mixed use, retirement, convalescent homes, and residential care and assisted living facilities, all of which have residents and all seem appropriate to prohibit in this particular area. Can you imagine in a coastal New England seaside village where you're placing your most vulnerable people that could be in this area is definitely prone to natural disasters. Hotels and motels are clearly flagged <clears throat> in the Atlantic Beach District Master Plan, indicating a glut and overdevelopment in this urban area. In 2007, when it was written, we were at 16% of all developable properties. We are now at 36%. The current hotel rooms necessary for foot traffic needed to achieve the tourism trade to augment a vibrant shopping area for localized use is there currently and some being proposed. So, and uh, let's see, in manufacturing, uh, just doesn't seem to specify a definition of manufacturing, especially looking at smaller players, let's say jewelry through assembly, making of beads or glass maker, selling their products in the same location. Perhaps it could be based on 
hours of operation, or by square footage percentage of the building. And um, the other question was, it seemed to be a little inconsistency between mixed residential and commercial use in a single building, section 719 and section 27A00. One is a by right, the other is a special use. And probably in this particular area, I would think they should be the same and both be prohibited. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I think I need to correct you on okay. a couple of things. We were very careful about, if you go to page two on our table, yeah, and you'll see most everything you talked about, some of it's absolutely prohibited, and some requires a special use permit. Yeah. So it's not okay, I mean there are. Yeah, but it is okay because it can be a yes. It, it can be, yeah, because it's a it process to give it a, yep. a thorough scrub. Okay. Yep. Thanks. I understand. Thanks, Art. Somebody else? Good evening. Uh, Judith Rosenthal, 99 Shore Drive, Middletown. Um, I just want to thank you all for your hard work and diligence and the preparation. I know that you spent many, many hours, and we, as a neighborhood, appreciate it very much. Um, I just, uh, regarding the use table, shouldn't a craft brewery be under retail outlet for wholesale outlet storage and manufacturing? Um, a tasting room needs to be limited by time, open seven to say nine. Um, if you list brewery under manufacturing, then it can't have retail or a tasting room. So I'm wondering if this should be under wholesale. And uh, additionally, how is this tasting room differentiated from a tavern or a bar? Uh, the thousand square foot seems to be a random number, and I think this should be flexible depending on the size of the building. It should be subordinate to wholesale and a percentage of the building size and anything over that be prohibited. The merging of lots. Under the Atlantic Beach District Master Plan in the section Building Site and Design, page seven, it states to maintain the views and vistas of the water by leaving the space between buildings, Aquidneck Avenue to Easton's Pond, small scale. In the uses table, any merging of lots should be prohibited to meet this requirement in this district. Building heights. For the same reason and to maintain the small scale look and feel and to ensure open spaces around the building, this area should be at 30 feet. This would preserve the New England seaside village architectural look that the AB Atlantic Beach District uh, Master Plan is seeking. Um, I think it would be really important to create a new committee known as the Atlantic Beach Overlay District Committee Due to the geographical importance of this area being a gateway to Middletown and its significance to Middletown's tax paying base and tourism, this urban area should reflect the importance of our town to the island and to the state. We need to develop a committee similar to a recognized historical preservation committee to define that New England seaside village features and functionality are being met and to manage signage issues. This area needs protection. Building size, <coughs> excuse me. This urbanized area should reflect the size and nature of existing buildings. There needs to be a cap on the minimum and maximum take, maximum, maximum take. For instance, Ria's Cafe being at 1,872 square feet. Uh-oh. I'm close to ending. Um, gross area with 1,872 living area. Seabreeze Inn, one of the larger buildings, yet the most reflective of a New England seaside village architecturally, is at 10,000 square feet uh, with 8,752 square feet living area. Beachside Liquors at 1,520 gross area with living area of 1,390 square feet. The goal is a mix of building sizes and doesn't overpower the area or create a tunnel. 
of buildings. Um, I just want to speak a little bit to um, the language in Section A, um, purpose. It states, the district will promote development that incorporates high quality building and landscape design consistent with a traditional New England seaside village. The language is very general and leaves the design open to interpretation. New England coastal architecture varies. For um, continuity, the elements of design need to be predicated on the New England architecture of existing historical buildings in the surrounding areas. Within Middletown are a variety of New England styles, ranging from Greek revi revival in the mid-1800s, shingle style, which appeared in the 1900s, interspersed with colonial. A perfect example of the shingle style is the compound of six shingle style houses known as the Land Trust Cottages laid out at the eastern end of Easton's Beach in 1886. There are other outstanding late 19th century houses along and near the ocean in the vicinity of, of Easton's Point. All this to say that the New England architectural elements are unique to Middletown's Atlantic Beach District and Easton's Point and should be researched and be more specifically defined. Also, just uh, one, one little note on the fencing. Um, I'm wondering why the, uh, the fencing has to be of a dark color. Could it not be white um, wood or a composite? That's it. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to answer that because I do have uh, black uh, for my fencing on my property and it just blends right in you don't see it but if you have something lighter it sticks out and that's all you see you'd be very surprised but if any of you want to see see some black fencing the link fence it really does just sort of disappear into my hedging and everything you, you really don't even notice that it's in existence I think the link fencing works in some cases where there's shrubbery to kind of soften it, but I don't see a, a black link fence as New England um, feeling. I see a white picket fence. Would you be giving your written comments to Ron? Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Art. Uh, Hang on, hang on. <laughs> Sorry. On the tasting room issue, uh, that's a new use. Um, and I think our solicitor would say that the state really controls an awful lot of how that works in terms of defining it and hours and, and things like that. So, and plus it requires a special use permit also. Okay. That's okay. The Department of Business Regulation has uh, regulations that distinguish between a tasting room versus a tavern or a bar. So. Okay, thank you. Please. Is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the. Okay. Um, Barbara Alpert, 70, Esplanade. We've lived here over 50 years. I want to thank you, um, the committee, for all the uh, good work they're doing in trying to protect this very fragile, complicated area. Um, so I'm beginning with wind turbines. It seems inappropriate for this um, to be in, for them to be in this area, much as we love wind turbines. Um, wireless facilities. If we're going through the expense of undergrounding our utilities, why would we permit other elements to be put there uh, that are above ground? The idea is to unclutter the area, not clutter it by adding unneeded extra um, facilities and stuff. By making this special use, you open the door for yes that doesn't belong in this New England seaside village. 
um, you open a Pandora's box because only one is approved and then every a building will apply for one. Um, commercial off-street parking. This should be limited by lot size, possibly 10%, or by the number of stories, and by arch architectural design and structure. Based on the future, it should include uh, Uber, Lyft drop-off and pickup space, electric car plug-in areas, areas for scooters and bikes uh, they're for thinking ahead. Shopping center, small scale. This particular use would actually be prohibited based on the definition found uh, for shopping center, which states, quote, a grouping of three or more commercial establishments, unquote. This wouldn't work if we don't allow merging of lots and if we wish to maintain vistas and views between properties as previously cited. And it, and it also states, quote, a small scale shopping center may be developed for rental of individual units or for sale of condominium units or a combination of both, unquote. Neither of these definitions appears appropriate or compatible with this very small and very urbanized area. Um, gas stations. In general, it would be a good idea not to have them, and although we already have one, and um, I don't know for sure, but I know surface runoff, which may be um, uh, a possibility of uh, gas stations, is uh, a large, largely responsible for uh, the pollution that goes into the beach when it's closed to first beach, our beach. Um, liquor store should, uh, shouldn't this include beer and wine? Laundry and dry cleaning, dry cleaning drop in and off may be okay, but a laundromat doesn't fit in this particular area. Library or museum doesn't seem to belong here in a floodplain area and an area of potential damage. Uh, private college or university, including dormitories, what do you mean by this in such a confined urban area? And is this a use you find in other urban New England seaside villages? So, thank you. Thank you. Will you be giving your comments, your written comments to Ron? Um, I think they're included in the comments that have been, uh, been given to you. Okay, thank so. you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Erin um, McEntee to Renfrew Park. I just have a quick question. I noticed that there's two existing commercial properties, that, um, Beaches Liquor and the consignment store, and they're not included in the this overlay district. Um, is there a reason that they're excluded? Those, those properties are zoned residential. So if and when those properties were to be rezoned to limited business consistent with the rest of the neighborhood, I would expect that the overlay district would then expand to cover those properties as well. But as we sit here today, those two properties are zoned residential. Okay, In thank you. Yeah. Do you want to speak? Good evening. <clears throat> My name is John Perillo in 53 Newport Avenue. My family has been paying taxes here almost 100 years. My grandmother settled on Warren Avenue for the summer, but I've been here, luckily, 13 years full time. And uh, I spoke to Ron about this uh, a couple of years ago, and I think this is a good opportunity uh, to include uh, something very historical that um, happened to in this district. Uh, in front of um, the um, uh, Atlantic Beach Club, uh, something happened. Uh, part of the uh, siege of Newport, uh, August the 28th, 1778, based on a letter from Nathaniel Green, who's second in command to Washington, to George Washington himself. If you Google it, you'll find the letter. It's August 28th letter, Washington, uh, Nathaniel Green, 
and it seems as though that Nathaniel Green uh, reported that there were 25 American soldiers that were killed uh, just before the Americans evacuated to uh, go to the uh, Battle of Rhode Island in uh, Portsmouth. Before that time, there was a big siege between uh, the British on the uh, other side of Eastern Pond, and then we, the Americans, occupied our side of Eastern Pond, this district, and uh, we have documentation. It's probably the best you could ever find of 25 Americans who gave their lives uh, and I think this would be a nice opportunity uh, uh, to celebrate these people and, and maybe direct people to uh, Slater Park uh, and, and say something about how five, 25 Americans gave their lives and um, uh, I think that would attract a lot of people and uh, interest and it goes on and on. There are more things that happen here, but I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. All right. Anyone else who would like to speak? Well, as Ron mentioned, um, we're going to give this another go around. So if any thoughts occur to you after you leave tonight, please send them in to Ron. We're going to be working on this some more, and then we'll have another public hearing where you can uh, comment on our next version. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any other comments from the members of the board? Do you have anything else? We have a motion to adjourn. So second. Motion's made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Meeting is adjourned.